Welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. Live from our New York City headquarters, we're giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. From today's top investing stories to Yahoo Finance's trending tickers to the macroeconomic forces shaping markets, we'll dig deeper into everything you need to know for that last hour of trading. And here's your headline bliss, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. Apple has maintained monopoly power in the smartphone market not simply by staying ahead of the competition on the merits, but by violating federal antitrust law. Look at Reddit as a community platform that has many paths to success. So the ads, the user economy, data, there's I think so many things we can do and so we're pursuing all of them. My thinking is we want our users to be investors, but we want our investors to be users as well. They will be patient with inflation, and you know, to be honest, they do have this optionality right now uh, to wait it out and see, especially given the resilience in the economy. We got one hour to go until the market close, and as always, uh, we are joined by Jared Blickery to get you up to speed on the market action. Uh, let's start with the major indices uh, right now, uh, because we have uh, the Dow trading higher by about 296 points here, about three quarters of one percent. The two-day move looks even more impressive. Of course, started upwards in more decided fashion uh, after the Fed meeting and Fed, pre Fed press conference yesterday. A similar move here for the Nasdaq. Uh, up about a quarter of 1%, the S&P 500 up about a third of 1%. A couple of things I want to note here. First of all, is that all three major averages are on track for record closes. They closed at records yesterday, so any gains today would be records once again. The other thing I want to note is we continue to see the broadening of the rally. How are we seeing that today? The S&P Equal Weight Index is up more than the S&P 500. It's up three quarters of 1%, as is the Russell 2000 of small caps up 1.2%. So this broadening of the rally that we've been talking about a a lot recently that is happening today and then just quickly as well want to take a look at the groups within the S&P 500 they are all up speaking of broadening all of them are up industrials financials consumer discretionary are leading the pack there's one stock in particular that Jared Blickery is watching at the New York Stock Exchange today that is right, Julie. I'll tell you what, Dow 40,000 plus a unicorn in one day, Reddit IPO. Uh, it just traded for the first time only a couple hours ago, pretty late in the day. And let's take a look at the intraday price range on the Wi-Fi Interactive. Uh, it did IPO at $34 last night, and today it hit a high of $57.80. And let's take a look at the intraday price action. There we go. Sometime after 1 p.m., finally got liftoff, finally got that first trade of the day. And uh, from there, well, we've headed down a little bit. I would like to remind people that most IPOs undercut their first day of trading sometime within the night, within the first year, to something like 95, 96% of the time. So very often do these things come down before they go back up. So there's no rush to get in. But I was looking at uh, the performance of some of the other social media ETFs. Really interesting to see. I mean, it was only 2012 that we had the, what was it? The face plant IPO. Uh, that was a disaster down at the dealer network. And that kind of skewed a lot of, a lot of uh, I think, social media players away from the New York Stock Exchange for a while. But we see the uh, we see uh, them coming back here in full force with uh, with the likes of Reddit today. And I will say there are some concerns over the uh, 1.76 million shares that are being offered directly to the market without the possibility of a lockup. Doesn't seem to be affecting the price action today. And just looking one more time, Reddit up about 42 and a half percent, guys. Jared, we're going to talk about one big stock in particular now, and that has to be Apple, because it is official, the Department of Justice filing an antitrust lawsuit against the iPhone maker, alleging that Tim Cook's company illegally maintains its dominance over the iPhone ecosystem by preventing rivals from offering competing services. Now, for its part, Apple not backing down one bit. It's going to fight this suit, saying this sets a dangerous precedent, in its words, that empowers government to take a heavy hand in designing technology. You can see the stock is down in today's trade, more than 4%. One more battle now um, between the U.S. government and big tech. Remember, the DOJ is suing Google while the FTC, Julie, is going after Amazon and Meta. And it's interesting that the shares are down today because in previous uh, instances where we have seen some of those other actions being brought, 
the market in some cases has shrugged them off. And we'll see if Apple's shareholders shrug this off beyond today, but it, seem, it, it feels like that this is more comprehensive and a bigger battle and sort of more comprehensive and yet more specific at the same time mm -hmm. in terms of the complaint and the breadth of it against Apple. So that you know that seems to be why we're seeing more of a reaction today, even as investors seem to also expect that this will take a long time. Uh, I've heard Microsoft mentioned a lot yeah, as a comparison yep. here. Um, to this case for, um, from the government against Apple. So that also, of course, as you said, took a long time. Yeah, no, already people, folks are saying, listen, this is a long, long process. It could very well take actually years to play out. There's sort of also, it was interesting, Julie, as you kind of reading through the commentary, there's also kind of political angle that's interesting sure. because folks at Trump, the prior Trump administration started this, but it's a natural question to ask with a very divisive election coming up, what if there was a change in the White House? How could that in any way impact yeah. or influence this case as well? Well. Yeah, most definitely. All right, let's bring, talk about more on this. We're going to bring in Yahoo Finance's Dan Howley. Dan, let me get your, your take on the big headline today. Yeah, I think uh, obviously the, the big headline is how broad this lawsuit is against Apple. I mean, they're going after everything from uh, the basics of how it locks people in with the iPhone, specifically saying that it locks people into its its ecosystem, uh, to the App Store, uh, to smartwatches and, and the Apple Watch. Uh, they're hitting on kind of a, a broad segment, and that's important to keep in mind because uh, if they end up hitting at least one of those, uh, it, it could be a big deal for Apple. I think, you know, when when it comes down to it, uh, the 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 big deal here would be if Apple has to change the App Store ecosystem, and then if it has to open up uh, to other uh, third parties as far as the capabilities that it offers with regards to, say, uh, its Apple Wallet, uh, making the tap to pay feature more available, uh, and the Apple Watch, making that more compatible with uh, third party smartphones, and then making other third-party watches more compatible uh, with Apple. I think that the big question is, if Apple has to do all of that, right, it has to open up, what does that then mean for its overall business? Does that mean that it starts to see people move out of the app store, go to third-party app stores, perhaps for cheaper uh, rates on apps? That's a, a, a real concern, and it could be something uh, that people jump into. Uh, as far as the, the Apple Watch versus Android watches goes, I mean, look, you know, I, I review these things. I, I use, you know, all of them. Uh, when it comes down to it, Apple's product is superior in that respect. It has a better watch than uh, Google or Samsung. It's, it's more stylish. It, it brings up uh, uh, what you want uh, right away. So I don't necessarily think that's going to be a problem for now. Uh, if things stay as they are, uh, you know, maybe Samsung or Google, if this ends up going anywhere, uh, ultimately develop more capabilities and, and can rival Apple. But as of now, I think people would stick with it. Uh, and then uh, as far as the, the tap to pay, I mean, that's going to be the, the biggest thing. If you uh, are able to use a, a different type of service with tap to pay, uh, you know, that, that just seems like a no brainer. Why wouldn't you do that? But, you know, I, I think as far as the, the, the third party app stores, again, if, if all of this ends up, uh, I don't know, Eight million years in the future, whenever the, this gets figured out, uh, <laughs> if all this uh, comes to Apple needing to open up the App Store in the U.S. as it has to in the EU, I think the bigger problem uh, for competitors is visibility. How do they uh, get people to want to download apps? It's a friction point for people, right? And people don't necessarily want to uh, do that. Even to get people to download apps is a friction point in and of itself. So I don't necessarily know if it's going to see more people. Uh, bounce out of the app store and then go to third-party app stores unless there's something that makes them extremely appealing. Now, uh, gaming is a big part of app store revenue. Gamers, they may be more likely to to go ahead and, and get a third-party app store, but it's not really the, the, those kind of uh, core gamers uh, that are willing to do that, uh, that Apple gets the bulk of its money from. It's from people like my mom who want to play you know, Candy Crush and that's going to be available on the app store still. And I, I don't see my mom downloading third-party app stores anytime soon. So I, I think, you know, net, net, uh, th there could be a problem uh, as far as the, the capabilities go for things like wallet and watch, but right. app store may still be safe. Mrs. Howley's got to have her candy crush. Come on. All right. Dan. She's crushing all the time. <laughs> Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, joining us now with more on the legal battle set ahead for Apple, joining us now, Deepwater Asset Management Managing Partner, Doug Clinton. Doug, thanks for being here. Um, so we're all trying to sort of get our arms around here, uh, around this here, and try to figure out what the implications will be, although it seems certain that they won't be 
immediate or imminent or even medium term. So how are you thinking about this? Julie, I think investors will ultimately shrug this off, not only because it's going to take years to ultimately figure out what is the resolution here, but I also think that even if we do get some changes to wallet, maybe some changes to watch and maybe some changes to messaging, I don't think any of those are going to be big enough changes to crack Apple's dominance in the smartphone market. I think the iPhone will probably lose almost no share in terms of the things we're talking about as part of this uh, antitrust case. And so ultimately, it's a scary headline. Apple will probably have to pay a several billion dollar fine as part of this, but I don't think that it threatens the overall ecosystem that they have built. Uh, also with us right now is New York University School of Law Professor Eleanor Fox. Professor Fox, it is great to have you on the show as well. I guess I want to bring, to start a high level, Professor. Um, you got time to look over uh, this, this uh, the, the lawsuit. I'm just curious how strong you think it is. Thank you, good to be here. Um, I think this is a, a very strong lawsuit. It's very, very well pleaded. Um, it details many incidents of Apple taking action in order to prevent the competition from occurring. And so basically the thrust of it is that Apple has taken many actions to prevent competition and therefore raising the prices to consumers and cutting out options for consumers. Uh, Eleanor, I wonder if you can give us any kind of insight into how exactly the, the Department of Justice decides which of these types of cases to bring, right? There are a lot of companies out there. It seems as though lately there have been a lot of cases against large tech companies in particular. Is it a matter of the confidence they can win a case? Is it, you know, how does this sort of get worked out? Right. So it's a combination of things. So, of course, big tech is very much in the headlines and people think big tech is very powerful. So they have a very high profile and the antitrust division, as well as the FTC, has been uh, learning a lot and doing a lot in order to pursue what they think are big tech anti-competitive practices. And of course, Apple is one of the biggest companies in the world by market cap. Uh, so. It affects all of our lives, most of our lives, and I think those considerations have caused the Justice Department to sue. Doug, I, maybe you can sort of walk me through one confusing part for me, which is I, I don't understand, Doug, where the consumer harm is. You know, you look at customer satisfaction rates for iPhones, they are off the charts. I mean, it's literally like 98%. People love their iPhones, they buy them. Every fall, they buy new ones. If you didn't want to buy an iPhone, go buy an Android device. Tell me if you agree or, or am, I, am I off track here? You are totally on track, Josh. I'm glad you brought it up because when you think about all these mega cap tech companies, there is a common thread, which is they are all the best service providers for the categories that they dominate. Amazon's the best retailer you can buy from, Google's is the best search engine, Meta has the best social apps. And what you see online just in general is because it is this open platform where there's zero cost of switching for most of these products, and I would argue zero cost of switching even for a phone, although you have to set up a new account if you move to Android from iPhone, the best products just win and they get this dominant market share. And so I, I struggle with the same question, Josh. I think that the consumers have ultimately benefited and won here, despite the fact that we're seeing very high market shares from all of these leading internet companies. Eleanor, I suspect that Apple's argument will be similar to what Doug is saying. Um, how successful is something like that going to be in court? Well, of course, the Department of Justice has a very different narrative mm -hmm. and has um, allegations that Apple charges excessive prices, for example, for developers that want to sell premium products on Apple. Apple charges about 30%, and this uh, would not happen if there were competition. Um, the complaint itself begins with a story, and it is a story of when a user of a Kindle on Apple um, wants to switch and switches to a Kindle on Android, 
And Steve Jobs finds out about it, and he says, this is, this is very bad. And that's sort of the beginning of the story, of the story that the DOJ is telling, is how Apple is trying to prevent consumers from switching at zero cost. A lot of the examples are about that. They are, and I'm sure we're going to hear much more about them as we all try to digest this and what it means. Thank you both so much for helping us understand it. Uh, Doug Clinton and Eleanor Fox, appreciate it. We're just getting started here on market domination. Coming up, stocks soaring today after the Fed put to rest investors' worries about future rate cuts. We're going to speak to a strategist uh, to break down the best ways to play the latest moves. Plus, Disney's proxy fight with activist Nelson Peltz is heating up. We'll give you all the details later in the hour. And we've got you covered on all of today's earnings that are coming out after the bell. We'll have the latest from Nike, Lululemon, FedEx. All that and more when market domination returns. Stocks rising today after the Federal Reserve yesterday signaled it will not it will delay but not slow interest rate cuts. For more on how investors should be playing the higher for longer Fed, let's welcome in Tony Dwyer, the chief market strategist for Canaccord Genuity. Tony, what was your read on the Fed was all, when all was said and done, and does it change anything in terms of how you're viewing strategy? So the late Marty Zweig had two phrases, um, especially for those that are new to investing. Don't fight the Fed and don't fight the tape. And what they've been telling us since the dovish, dovish pivot is that they're going to be cutting rates, not raising rates. Yesterday, he really reinforced that when he said that we're at a cycle high in rates 
and we're still looking to cut three times this year. Now, it's borderline between two and three, so you could have a nuance there. But ultimately, the Fed is in easing mode, and that's benefiting the tape. Tony, they also lifted their projections for economic growth this year. Does that kind of dovetail with what you're seeing? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Um, they, they increased their estimate for growth, they increased their estimate for inflation, but they didn't decrease their estimate for how many cuts they're going to have or the fact that they're going to stay cutting versus higher for longer or, or, um, or even raising rates. The problem that I have, Josh, is the data that's coming in is wholly incomplete. One of the things, if you remember back in January, as you can see on that chart, the Fed has raised rates in a historic way. It's the fastest rate hike cycle in history. Um, so you would imagine that it would have had a, a bigger economic impact, but there's been a source of capital that didn't exist before in the private credit market that has replaced bank lending um, and other area uh, capital markets activity those areas kind of held, uh, the private credit market kept things afloat last year, and it kind of neutralized the impact of an inverted yield curve and higher interest rate environment on bank lending. And we're trying to figure out, the market's trying to figure out where we stand in that. At this point, it's really tough to get good data. Well, and it also sounds like, you know, if what you're saying, if, if indeed private credit was really the one of the main reasons here, does that permanently, or at least for as long as we can see, sort of decrease the effectiveness of interest rates as a tool, right? Either, yep. you know, either tightening or loosening. It, as long as, as long as um, employment stays fine, that, that's the key here, Julie. As long as employment stays fine, because it's a service-based economy, 67% of the, of the U.S. economy and consumption is service-based. So as long as everyone's working, you can sp you have money and increased money to spend. So here's the rub. In January, remember how many people like me came on shows like yours and said, well, there's 335,000 jobs. The Fed may not even cut rates this year at all. And then all of a sudden, Fast forward to this most recent report, the prior two months were revised downward by a, almost 175,000 jobs. So that negated that real upside surprise. So the problem is that the data coming into the Fed and us is very incomplete. Companies aren't responding in time to the Bureau of Labor Statistics survey to actually get good reads. So the Fed has had one time in their history where they've got it right, 1995, after a tightening cycle, a sharp tightening cycle, they got it right. It was a soft landing and the, and the market stayed strong. That was when it was good data coming in. They're having a challenging time getting good data now. And so Tony, so bottom line though, you know, listen, we had a big update yesterday, green across my screen here again today. Yep. I'm just curious, where, where do you think we head from here? How does this market play out here in, in you know, the next six, 12 months? So as I said, don't fight the Fed. Well, don't fight the tape. Earlier this year, uh, after that Fed um, pivot, the December dovish pivot, as it's called, there was a breath thrust that I can't, no matter how you tear it apart, it was a good move in the market that each time has suggested nine to 12 months out, you're up almost literally every time that doesn't mean it's going to happen, but that's what's happened when you have these kind of breath thrusts. So there can be a lot of churn in the middle of it. But ultimately, by the end of the year, it should be a pretty good year. You don't want to fight of the, when the folks printing the money are telling you their game plan. You tend to listen, especially if the tape is agreeing. And in, now, instead of following the MAG-7 or large cap tech or whatever you want to call it, do you want to follow that breath? In other words, as I noted earlier, yeah. you got the S&P equal weight beating the, the broader market today. You have the Russell really beating the market today. Is that where you want to be? So I just I, to be clear in my prior comment, I don't think you want to fight the tape, but you don't need necessarily need to chase it because yeah. if you're looking at the S&P 500, you're up on really seven to 10 stocks, not just in tech, it's been in multiple industries, but it's been those mega cap stocks. So what makes you want to buy the average stock or have the troops catch up with the generals? And Julie, as you know, I for me, it always comes down to earnings. Literally last year, according to my earnings wizard at LSEG, uh, TJ Dillon, S&P operating profits would have been negative last year if it weren't for the MAG-7. That's true again this quarter. So what I think we're starting to sniff out in the bottoming of the equal weight relative to the S&P or the Russell 2000 relative to the S&P, it's starting to sniff out that changes later in the year. 
where the earnings growth isn't dominated just by seven stocks, it's more evenly distributed. So if I have a Fed that's easing interest rate policy, if I have a breadth thrust where investors are, are kind of you know, a little bit too much right now, chasing the gains in the market, but you have earnings justification for a broadening, not necessarily another 10% S&P move, but a broadening where there's more stocks participating with the move, I think you have a good setup for that as we go into the year end. Tony, we always love having you on the show. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, guys. Time now for call of the day. Broadcom shares, let's take a look there. They're jumping today after TD Cowan gave it an upgrade. So the backstory here, Julie, is company hosts their AI event and analysts really seem to like what they heard there. Mm -hmm. Cowan raises their rate to outperform. They say this reflects potential upside from both custom silicon and back-end AI networking. Price target goes to 1,500. They do not risk, by the way, for their clients. They like, you know, risk, what if data center spending slows? What if the capital term program doesn't kind of accelerate as expected, but that is obviously not their base case. Yeah, and they give some specific reasons of what they liked from that event that you referred to, which was a sort of infrastructure event. Um, they said now we know that there are more customers for their silicon, their custom silicon business, which they said is a positive thing here. We knew about Google. Um, TD Cowan's guessing that this is probably Meta uh, is another uh, customer here, so that's something that they like. Uh, they also like uh, the potential for greater than expected growth and synergies from their VMware acquisition, mm -hmm. which they closed on. So those are just a couple of the reasons that they're, they're liking the stock here. And by the way, liking the stock after a run, it's all, I mean, I like that they put in the note better late than never, yeah. <laughs> because this is a stock that has already rallied, and I think 80%, including now TD Cowan, are positive. 80% of the analysts who cover it have buy equivalent ratings on the stock. Yeah. So they're you know coming a little late to the party, but they, you know, they're and it's been a party. There. This yeah. stock's already up about 25% this year. It's up about 120% over the past 12 months. Wow, yeah. big move. And we've got another call of the day for you as well. Adobe, it's being given a rare sell rating over at KeyBank. Uh, the analysts there initiating coverage of the software giant with an underweight rating, citing generative AI and competitive pressure as potential reasons for slow growth in its creative cloud offering. Um, it's interesting here because this is a, an initiation note for software broadly. Yep. But the Adobe one really does stand out, again, because there aren't that many sell equivalent ratings on Adobe here. And the two reasons are competition, and not necessarily competition from AI at this point. Canva is a, is a company that has been competing against Adobe mm -hmm. that is name checked in this. And then secondly, generative AI is also part of it. So it's, it's sort of two pronged competition. Yeah, and it's interesting too, the, you know, as you said, Joey, he, the key bank analysts here, you're initiating coverage on the software space. Mm -hmm. And broadly, he's telling clients he likes what he sees. So he looks at backdrop, he says, you know, this looks like similar to the pre-pandemic period. And he says the setup, they say, produced above average returns, lower volatility, so that's good news. And he names some he, names he likes. He likes Microsoft, likes ServiceNow. Mm -hmm. Adobe, though, he doesn't like, and kind of echoing these concerns we've had about the rise of Gen, Gen AI and Gen AI-focused companies and just the competitive risk that's gonna play on Adobe. And certainly when Adobe last reported, remember he broke those earnings, disappointing the street, that did kind of emphasize and heighten the bear case there. Yeah, and all of these companies who've been having like their developer conferences and, and whatnot, Adobe's about to have one as well. So we'll yep. see if that ends up pre presenting a catalyst for the shares. All right, we've had a slew of economic data today, much of it painting a picture of a growing economy. The latest PMI data showing U.S. manufacturing activity expanded by the most in almost two years. Home sales rising in February by more than estimated at the fastest pace in a year. And initial jobless claims fell last week, suggesting that job growth remained strong in March. All of this uh, coming against a backdrop of the Fed saying three cuts are still on the table. And the result, of course, has been some serious market optimism here. Let's talk more about what's going on with the expansion uh, and what we're seeing in the economic data. we got the founder and president of Macro Policy Perspectives, Julia Coronado, joining us right now. Hi, Julia. Hi, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. Out of all of that economic data today, one thing that stood out to me is that um, within the S&P PMI report, we saw mm -hmm. the measure of prices charging, charged by manufacturers climbing to its highest in more than a year. And of mm -hmm. course, I'm watching everything inflation related very closely. What did you make of that and, and, and also the Fed's comments yesterday specifically on inflation? 
So with the manufacturing uh, report, the prices index, sub-index, tends to track commodity prices and energy prices in particular fairly closely. So we know that energy prices, that, that oil prices have gone up to the upper end of the range they've been in recently. Um, that's not a terribly big surprise. Um, it doesn't necessarily contain a broader signal content for prices in the economy. Uh, the manufacturing sector in the U.S. is relatively small, uh, and you know, really, the services sector is the driver. So I, I don't, I'm not alarmed by it. I don't read a broader signal in it. Um, I do agree with your characterization that the full suite of data that we've got suggests that the economy remains on track. Um, you know, we're tracking <clears throat> a little south of two percent on our GDP tracking, partly because the consumer spending side of things softened a bit in Q1, but that's probably, you know, just part of the usual ebbs and flows. It was probably a little bit overstated in Q4, a little bit soft in Q1. On average, I think consumers have jobs, they're spending, and the economy remains on track. Julie, you know, it's interesting just to see how investors are reacting. You know, yesterday, big up day. We're higher again today. Do you think, Julie, we, we might want to take kind of a deep breath here, though? I mean, aren't there there's some risks that looking ahead, we get more of those firmer than expected inflation prints? You know, that's always possible. Um, I don't, one of the key changes in the landscape over the last year that has facilitated inflation taking a pretty big step down is that consumers are price sensitive again. So we have to be careful of tra about translating every uh, change in input costs for producers into costs for consumers. Before the pandemic, we did not see that. Firms did not have a ton of uh, pricing power. Then during the pandemic, price sensitivity melted away. Consumers were awash in stimulus uh, and they could only spend on a few things. So uh, firms enjoyed some pricing power. That has melted away again. We hear that in earnings report after earnings report. It has helped restore lower inflation. Uh, it means that you know firms are looking more towards efficiency gains and cost cutting to maintain or enhance margins. So I, I, I don't think we're back in that environment where every wiggle of input costs gets priced through to the consumer and to broader inflation. I am not particularly worried about that. And I don't think it sounds like the Fed isn't quite as worried about that as they were uh, last year when they were getting all this good news on inflation, they were deeply skeptical. It continued. You had a little bit of a setback uh, at the beginning of the year, but less than last year. So annual rates of inflation keep moving down. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's interesting times because there's a wide range of views in the market uh, amongst our clients. There's just tremendous range of views between people that are sanguine on inflation like ourselves and those who do think that there's another upsurge around the corner and that the Fed's about, people think the Fed's going to make a mistake in one direction or another. And we actually think that they're balancing the risks reasonably well. It does It does feel like people who don't have confidence in the Fed never have confidence in the Fed, no matter which that way. That is true. That you know? is true. So, the, the, the Fed is always the favorite lightning rod for yes, the market. So. Yes, I'm sure you and I have heard from some of those folks uh, over the years. But, uh, Julia, mm -hmm. when when we talk about the persistence of so-called super core inflation, that which the yeah. Fed has been watching closely, how do you think that is going to play out this year in maybe finally starting to moderate a little bit more? Where's the alleviation of the pressure going to come from on that front? That's a great question. So we have a very specific view. We've seen goods uh, inflation go back to pre-pandemic rates of deflation. We actually think we're going to get a little bit more deflation on the goods side this year, particularly from cars. New car prices are finally cracking um, with improvements in inventory and chip availability and Again, consumers back in the, the driver's seat, <laughs> pun intended, um, and, and driving prices lower. So new and used cars are poised to fall this year, fall outright. The, the housing inflation is going to, we think, going to be the next one to take a step down. It's We have all the leading indicators, as Powell said yesterday. Timing uncertain, but direction seems clear. Supercore, we think, will be the last to give way. There still is some stickiness in things like car insurance, uh, financial services, 
Uh, so we do think that that is going to gradually moderate uh, over time, but we're not relying on that to lead the way. We think that's going to be the last thing to step down. Julia, thanks so much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Coming up, Disney's proxy fight with activist Nelson Peltz is heating up as Peltz has now won a key backing from a proxy advisory firm, giving you all the details and market domination returns. Taking a look now at a trending ticker of the day, Disney's proxy fight with activist Nelson Peltz heating up. Peltz winning a key backing from proxy advisory firm Institutional Shareholder Services, other, otherwise known as ISS. So Julie, yes, ISS saying shareholders should vote for Nelson Peltz at that shareholder meeting coming up on April 3rd. So now we got kind of a, a showdown because Glass Lewis said shareholders should support the company back slate of nominees, but ISS saying no, Mr. Peltz has the experience, given his history and other boards, best position, they say, to bring a shareholder perspective to the Yeah, board. it's interesting the shares are not moving much today, and it kind of makes sense, because at this point, we're not going to know what the outcome is until April 3rd, mm -hmm. right, or shortly thereafter, if the votes aren't all counted right away, so, you know, that, that kind of tracks here. Um, it's interesting, because there were some other folks who are also supporting Peltz, it's companies 
who were previously targeted by him, who yeah. said, oh, he's just, he's a big old pussycat. He's great to work with. They didn't say that exactly, but sort of, you know, that he yeah. seems scary from far away, but once he gets up close, he's, you know, he's del a delight to work with, is effectively what they said. Well, let's get to Yahoo Finance senior reporter Alexander Canal for more on this. So, Ali, what would you make of this headline? This was pretty surprising, considering what we heard from Glass Lewis earlier this week, and it's certainly a big win for Nelson Peltz when you think about uh, you know, such an influential proxy advisory firm coming out in support of him. ISS saying that Peltz could be additive to the board, considering he's a shareholder, um, a significant shareholder at the company. In the report, ISS saying, quote, Peltz, with his considerable experience on other boards and fiduciary duties owed to a large shareholding group, appears best positioned positioned to bring a shareholder perspective to the board. Now, what's notable here is that ISS said that shareholders should not vote for mm -hmm. Tryon's other nominee, which is Jay Rasulo. He's the former CFO at Disney. Um, and they said just pelts. They also advised shareholders against voting for Blackwell's not three nominees. That's the other proxy fight Disney's dealing with. And that they should withhold their vote against current Disney board member Maria Elena Lagamcino. So the thought being there that pelts would replace Maria Elena Elena. But going back to earlier this week, Glass Lewis, which again supports Disney's current board, they referred to CEO Bob Iger's initiatives at the company and that he's really seemed to turn around the company at mm -hmm. this point in time. ISS did acknowledge that. They said, look, we understand that some shareholders might be fine with the way Disney is operating right now. However, their biggest concern uh, stems from succession mm -hmm. yeah. and all the drama that happened in 2020. Which is Peltz's concern too. Right, one which of is them. Peltz's right. concern too. So in their view, they think Peltz could be someone that perhaps could bring a fresh perspective and could help with succession yep. because that seems to be the biggest overhang of this company. But you were just talking about how Peltz has received some support. Disney has some support as well. Yeah, they Jamie have... Diamond, George, George Lucas, Lucas yep. uh, the widow of Steve Jobs. Steve yes. Jobs, remember, was a very close friend of Iger. So we'll see. April 3rd is that shareholder meeting. I think this proxy battle is not going to get resolved before yeah. then. I think no. at this point, Nelson Pauls wants to take it to the finish line. Yeah. So we'll have to see what happens. We will. Thanks so much, Alan. Yeah. Appreciate it. Well, it's been a big week in the chip space as NVIDIA held its GTC event this week. And CEO Jensen Wong giving a shout out to Synopsys. It's the chip design company, which also made its own series of announcements at the event and at its own event. And it's working with NVIDIA to substantially accelerate chip design and automotive prototyping using AI. On top of that, Synopsys adjusted its full year guidance as it decided to sell its software integrity group business. Joining us now is the CFO of Synopsys, Sheila Glazer. Sheila, thanks so much for being here, appreciate it. Hi, Julie, great to be with you. So uh, in terms of how Synopsys fits into this bigger ecosystem, right? You all are helping sort of build the chips or, or provide the software infrastructure to further design the chips that start with NVIDIA. Is that the, the best way to think of it? And what is the significance of the announcements this week? Yeah, that's exactly the way to think about it. So we build the software that semiconductor engineers use to actually make these incredible chips that we saw launched this week. And the significance of the announcement, we were really pleased to you know, be front and center in NVIDIA's GTC. The significance of this amount of announcement is with the continued move of high performance compute, you really simply can't build a leading edge chip without us. And so we're excited to partner with NVIDIA to solve these really complex problems facing the industry. And uh, we're looking forward to continued growth, which as you said, we also updated our guidance based on the strength we're seeing in the industry. Sheila, I'm interested, this work that you're doing with NVIDIA, is it exclusive to NVIDIA? I mean, are you locked in there or you, can you do, can you work with AMD and Intel as well? Well, the work that we talked about with NVIDIA, we're working with them to use accelerated compute uh, in uh, designing chips, and we're working with them to use accelerated compute in actually manufacturing chips, which is the most intensive workload in the industry. But our software tools can be used by anybody in the industry. And we support all the leading semiconductor companies. We support hyperscaler co companies. And also we support automotive companies. So we have a very open platform and we have the ability to support on any given foundry that anybody wants to build a ship on. 
Um, obviously, Sheila, the um, numbers that NVIDIA has been regularly putting up have gotten the market's attention um, in terms of the size of the potential AI opportunity there. Now, when we've caught up with Sassine recently, um, Sassine Ghazi, your CEO, you know, he's talked about the opportunity here, but it does seem to be a smaller magnitude. Can you help us understand, especially since you're the numbers person, how we should think about the opportunity for synopsis going forward around AI? Absolutely. So AI is fueling not only chip design, so more AI chips are being built, which means that people need more of our tools and more of our software. And then also we're infusing AI into all of our tools. So think about our tools creating even more productivity for the engineers that buy our tools. And what we talked about yesterday is we view our TAM long-term, a double-digit TAM of about 12%. And we believe over the long-term AI is going to add about 2% additional TAM to that. So growing our TAM from 12 to 14%. Well, and uh, Sheila, if I, if I can follow up on that, I, that doesn't sound, given like the huge, you know, descriptors we've heard around AI, right, from the likes of Jensen Wong, 2% increase to TAM doesn't s seem like that big with, you know, I, I mean, I'm a lay person, right? But it just sounds like the rhetoric around it is so big. And even if we're talking about a 2% increase to a total addressable market, which in number terms is probably pretty a lot, 2% doesn't seem like a lot. Is there a re Yeah, so in our industry, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, again, we're the software that helps build the chips. So for us, we're looking forward to, you know, continuing to grow the business. We've been growing it the last several years. We grew the business. This is 17% Kegger, and we're looking forward to outperforming the TAM growth. And for us, that's significant. And as you mentioned, we updated our guidance this year. Our growth for the year is going to be 14 to 15%. So uh, we think it's got tremendous opportunity, and we're really excited about the capability that we're giving our customers. Sheila, you know, your big rival here is Cadence. Um, and I know you're buying Ansys, but you know, Cadence, you know, it, it already has a, a physical design business. I'm just curious what sets you two apart. Well, so uh, our focus is really on becoming a silicon to systems company. And what we mean by that is you think about uh, an automotive, an EV, that's a system. And really it's just becoming a compute device. And when uh, customers want to go design, you know, the next EV or the next um, uh, iteration, they want to be able to bring the physical testing world and the digital testing world together. And we bring the digital portion, that's what our software tools are, and they bring the physical portion. So they've got multi-physics, and Ansys is the number one leader in multi-physics simulation. And so we're adding our leadership portfolio to their portfolio to solve really pressing customer needs in our core customers and increasingly in automotive customers, aerospace and industrial customers. Sheila, thanks so much, really appreciate it. We should mention, by the way, the Synopsys shares are up more than 60% over the past 12 months. So obviously, uh, you've been benefiting as the business has been growing. Appreciate your time. Julie and Josh, great to be with you. Thanks for the time. So to come, we're looking at how to navigate the big picture in home builder stocks with today's investor playbook. Stick around, more market domination on the other side.
Mortgage rates ticked up after two weeks of declines, and today we're looking at how to navigate the big picture in home builder stocks with the Yahoo Finance Playbook. We're joined now by John Lavallo, UBS Equity Research Channels, covering U.S. home builders uh, building products. John, it is good to see you. I'm looking at the XHB, John, so that you know the home builders ETF. It's up about 15% this year. It's up about 70% over the past 12 months. That seems to be pricing in a lot of good news, John. Uh, thanks for having me, Josh, first of all. Um, yes and no. Right? I, we've certainly had a nice run over the past year or so, but if you look at valuation across our group, we're still looking at a group that's trading at you know nine and a half times earnings, um, just over one and a half times book. You compare that to the S&P 500, which is trading closer to 21 times next year's earnings and close to four times book. And I think you can make a real argument that these stocks are incredibly compelling at these levels. So yes, the stocks have run, but they're, they're still not pricing in uh, that much, frankly. And John, um, I think we're, we all know there seems to be a lot of demand out there, but we have seen some, some gross margin compression for some of these companies because they keep offering incentives because of affordability issues, because of still high um, mortgage rates, et cetera. Where are we in that sort of gross margin cycle, if you will, and are things getting better? Yeah, it's a great question, Julie. Um, it's interesting, right? I would tell you as a starting point, this industry has evolved tremendously over the past decade, where this was a business that historically was, you'll call 20% gross margin, 10% SG&A as a percentage of sales, 10% operating margin. We're now looking at a business that's probably 23-ish percent gross margin, maybe nine, eight or 9% SG&A, probably closer to 14 or 15% operating margins. There's been a lot of structural changes that have occurred, some of it forced through efficiencies driven by COVID, some of it just from a more sort of simplified building process, if you will. The gross margins, to your point, have come down off of the COVID peaks, but are leveling off at levels that are, you know, a good two to 300 basis points above historical average. And frankly, I think we've reached a point where we've sort of troughed, if you will. And according to our model, you'll see a little bit of degradation this year, but then we'll start to see a gradual improvement as we move into 2025 and 2026. Uh, John, one question I had, and just help me think through, through this, is, you know, if the Fed's telling you three cuts are coming this year, you know, they start cutting, John. Let's say, you know, existing homeowners, okay, now they start getting more comfortable. They feel more comfortable selling. It's time to move to Boca. Supply mm -hmm. ramps. What would that, what would the impact of that be on your coverage universe, John? Yeah, Josh, it's, it's, it's a highly debated question right now. Here's how we shake out on it. First of all, as a starting point, I would tell you that 80% of mortgages are below 5%, 60% are below 4%. On top of that, the home builders would tell you that sort of 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 is the sweet spot where they're buying down rates to. So what does that mean? It tells me that rates would have to fall pretty meaningfully from current levels of around 7% on the 30-year fix before we would see significant supply come back to the market. So that's as a starting point. But maybe more importantly, what I would tell you is that the largest part of the housing market, which is the existing home market, historically has constituted 80 to 90% of sales, is essentially frozen. We're looking at you know 4.3 million units was the print today on existing home sales. We were just over 4 million units for the full year last year. That should be closer to 5 million, maybe even 5.5 million units. So we need that market to recover because at the end of you know, on the other side of a transaction on an existing home sale, there's generally a, a home that's purchased. Many times that's a new home and we just need that churn to come back. So, uh, you know, look, we would take lower rates all day long for housing, whether it's new homes, existing homes. I think the market just needs to kind of get back into a pace. Um, John, so clearly you seem relatively optimistic on the sector writ large. I understand your top two names are what KB and Lennar, if I'm not mistaken. What what stands out about those two? Our top pick, Julie, uh, honestly, is is Dr. Horton. Ah, gotcha. um, KB, K, but but no, you're, you're right. KB and Laura are, are two home builders that we have buy ratings on, it and we are have favorable opinion on. For Dr. Horton, though, uh, the reason we are, you know, it is our top pick in the group. Are a couple things. One, it's the largest builder by volume, by call it ten or eleven percent. There are a lot of advantages to size and scale. They also attack what we believe is the hottest part of the market, which is that first time entry level buyer. Where frankly, you're looking at a need based, event-driven, life event-driven, meaning children or marriage, things of that nature, um, type buyer. And also what I would say is, you know, among the best uh, executors with, within our group. So I think it checks a lot of boxes and, and that is our top pick. John, thank you so much for joining the show today. It was great having you.
Appreciate it, guys. Take care. While we're wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination overtime. There's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it is market domination overtime. Let's check on where the major averages ended up, and we know if they ended up at all, but they closed at record. So we did see a gain of about two-thirds of 1%, 270 points or so for the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. That means another record close. The S&P 500 up a third of 1%. That means another record close, even though it's off the highs of the session. And the Nasdaq just up a fifth of 1% enough for a record close. As we pointed out e earlier, we see outperformance today in the equal weight, the S&P equal weight, as well as the Russell 2000 here. So all of those are gaining more than the broader market today. We continue to see yields kind of go sideways here, which doesn't hurt this perception that the Fed is going to be cutting um, three times. At least that's the Fed's own perception here. So interesting to see this momentum continue here. And Josh has got one stock to watch that didn't hurt matters either today. 
No, we got to talk about Micron, Julie. Investors piling in here. That stock ripped higher in today's trade. Look at that move. Maker of memory chips gave a strong sales forecast. And the company also using that phrase investors love so much, artificial intelligence. CEO, CEO saying Micron is one of the biggest beneficiaries in the semiconductor industry of the multi-year opportunity enabled by, by AI. Investors also, Julie, we know, very excited about a new kind of chip known as HBM. If we can just nerd out for a second, basically this is super <laughs> high-speed memory that sits on a data center GPU. What is demand like for that? And I think this was the big key in the conference call. Micron expects several hundred million dollars of revenue from HBM products in fiscal 24 and said the overwhelming majority of its 2025 supply has already been allocated. Investors like the sound of that. Yes, they did. Um, and I was just looking through some of the commentary here. Joseph Moore, who covers Micron over at Morgan Stanley, saying the biggest surprise was management's continued visibility and enthusiasm, because yeah. tone matters a lot when we're talking about these things. Although Moore himself says that he thinks that there will be a weaker second half. All right, we shall wait and see. Yeah. A busy day on Wall Street from Apple to Reddit to fallout from the Fed. Josh Schaefer is here with the takeaways from the trading day. Joshua. All right, Josh, we had Apple down today in the market up. This is a trend, of course, we've been seeing for a little bit now, mm -hmm. but it just stuck out to me. Our friend Sam Rowe actually highlighted this on Twitter. There weren't a lot of days in the past, when you go back over the past couple of years, really maybe even the past decade, that you see a stock like Apple, a major tech stock, a big tech stock that drives the market, fall over 3%, and still everything is up and even tech is up, right? Yeah. And you, you have sort of a pretty big deal here coming with Apple that you could argue could span to other tech companies. You sort of wonder where that reaches out to, and normally that would cause some sort of, I don't know, I guess at least a little bit of anxiety you would yeah. think amongst investors. But when you look across the NASDAQ 100 today, we just didn't really see that. And I think perhaps maybe just a sign, guys, of the overall sentiment right now. Well, okay, that's an Apple problem, but the rest of tech is fine. Let's keep buying the rest of tech. Mm -hmm. And that's just an Apple issue. And I don't think that's always really kind of been the case for that stuff. No, it hasn't been. I mean, you know, also, man, Reddit bankers must, must have been breathing a sigh of relief today that the IPO came on this day in particular mm -hmm. when the overall market was up, when sentiment seemed pretty decent. And they got a big pop in the stock. It took a while for it to open, but when it, it finally did. It, it took a while for it to open, but it closed above where it opened, right? So we know that it was priced By at- By a lot. Yeah, <laughs> it was priced at $34, and then it actually opened at $47, so it actually closed above that. You can see on your screen now at 50. And one of the other takeaways I sort of had here was, yes, it closed up by a lot, but maybe not an aggressive, I, I just didn't know what to expect from Reddit. I felt yeah. like we could have had maybe total meme stock mania reaction here, whether it be to the downside or the upside. And to me, maybe one of the takeaways from just this sort of market action was, okay, it, it was an IPO. Like it, it was a normal IPO relatively, like we've seen this happen before with the stock going up compared to where it was priced at the night before. That's not necessarily a totally outrageous jump. Of course, we're talking about, as you mentioned, Julie, I think it started trading at 1230, so. Yes, what, it took a while. Th th three, three hours of trading is right. sort of what we're overanalyzing here. Yeah. We'll have to watch how the stock moves over the next couple months. But I thought it was interesting just to see nothing necessarily too crazy. Nothing broke. Nothing broke. Yeah. That's always good. Yeah, that's a win. Yeah. It's such an interesting kind of company to think about, too, because, I mean, you have this huge user base and really healthy top line growth, Josh. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, you, you did hear, you know, you had questions about a company that's been around this long, but still posting the kind of losses they were doing in 2023. Sort of some puts and takes that were interesting it, to watch. It's gonna be interesting, Josh, as people sort of continue to dig into the business here and we get closer to an actual earnings report where we have the street creating expectations here. How does that company match? When you think about a lot of the companies that are in this space, that are perhaps compa comparable when you think of a Snapchat, when you think of a Pinterest, those companies haven't necessarily had great earnings reports going back over the last couple of years as we talk about the broader ad market and some of the slowdown we've seen there. So it'd be interesting to see what happens with Reddit as it comes a little bit more under Wall Street's microscope and sort of the euphoria of the IPO kind of fades. And then finally, as we continue to digest the Fed, everything's all right, right? Inflation's gonna come down, everything's gonna be okay. No, Julie, that was my take yesterday, <laughs> right? So yesterday I was all positive. I, I felt too positive when I walked off with you guys. So I said, guys, I'm gonna come back <laughs> with some sort of bear spin. We, we gotta calm down a little bit here. So I wanted to highlight 
one of the inflation risks that some people are still talking about here. John Hilsenrath, uh, who used to cover the Fed for the Wall Street Journal, a very prominent reporter, highlighted this. And it's interesting. This was deep in the summary of economic projections, what you're looking at on your screen now. And this is risk to core PCE inflation. You're looking at how many Fed officials saw broadly balanced risks versus weighted to the upside. Weighted to the upside is in purple. Light blue is what they saw in December. So you actually saw more officials highlighting that the risk could be to the upside on inflation, which I found rather interesting. It's just something to keep in mind. Like, yes, we were excited about the economic growth that the Fed upgraded. We were excited that the cut stayed at three. But that core PCE number did come up, and you wonder at what point maybe that is a risk. And then, guys, I do have one other risk that I found, too, that I found rather interesting when we think about the markets overall and tying it in. Earnings estimates right now are just insanely high. And if we're thinking about a market potentially being priced to perfection in some ways, it's been interesting just to think about earnings estimates. We're looking at Q4 earnings expected to grow 17% year over year. And it just seems interesting to wonder if that can hold up. We know earnings often normally come down. Those estimates usually come down. So if we're pricing, if the market is pricing things correctly right now, maybe as those estimates come down, that's where we see a pullback. That's something that some of the strategists that are suggesting we're going to see a pullback in the near term are wondering, OK, when we start to maybe come back down to earth with these estimates, maybe that's when the S&P comes a little bit back down to earth and stops going up every day. Maybe. Maybe. Or maybe it just goes up every day, Josh. <laughs> Could happen. We'll bring you back. <laughs> Schaefer, thank you. To say the opposite yeah. thing. <laughs> All right, let's get to Lululemon, Julie. They are reporting results, and we are seeing a drop here in the after hours initially. initially. Go through the numbers. Um, EPS comes in at 529, revenue 3.21 billion. The estimate was 3.19 billion. I think it's the forecast here, Julie, mm -hmm. that's causing some issues. Q1 EPS 2.35 to 2.4. Street was closer to 255, and the revenue looks like a miss. 2.18 to 2.2 billion. Again, consensus was more like 2.26. Yeah, I mean, Lululemon had come out and pre-announced, pre right? So definitely the forecast is going to be more weighted when it comes to the reaction that we're seeing in the shares here. The company also says first quarter earnings per share will be $2.35 to $2.40. Analysts have been looking for 255, so that too is short of what analysts have been anticipating. I'm looking at the statement here, um, and that revenue growth in the first quarter is a growth of 9 to 10% that the company is forecasting here. Um, so it's still seeing growth, potentially even double-digit growth, but Lululemon has been going at such, such a pace that perhaps if there's some slowing momentum, that's something that would be... Um, that would be disappointing to investors here. Something else I should note, they're coming out with 2024 forecasts as well of revenue of up to $10.8 billion and diluted earnings per share of up to $14.20. The company is saying in its statement that guidance does not reflect potential future repurchases of its shares. It's not making any kind of buyback announcement today, but seems to be holding out the possibility that that would happen. Yeah, you know, this stock, Julie, it was already in the red so far this year heading into mm -hmm. this print. So if you were a bull, I think you were hoping for some type of catalyst here, at least initially in the after hours. Investors don't seem like they, they saw it. Lots of questions always on competition and what is a very competitive category. I think you'll have you know more color about the consumer, what do kind of underlying demand trends look like an international expansion. I mean, that's another key theme for this name, specifically China. We know the company has been seeing you know, strong growth there. Um, do those trends, they think, kind of continue despite what's been obviously kind of a, a shaky macro over there. All right, we've got uh, FedEx numbers that are out as well at the moment here. Uh, that company coming out with a forecast that is, uh, it looks like it is narrowing its forecast. Fiscal full year uh, earnings per share at 1725 to 1825. It had seen it had seen $17 to $18.50 here. So uh, a bringing up on the low end, but bringing down on the upper end. It's also announcing a new buyback program of $5 billion here. And the company says for the full year, it uh, will see a decline in revenue in the low single digit range here. So I'm focusing all on the forecast, but of course the company also reported its third quarter numbers, which beat our earnings per share beating by 40 cents. Uh, it looks like revenue coming in a little bit shy of what analysts had been anticipating here. Um, and uh, coming in at $21.7 billion, analysts have been anticipating $22.05 uh, But it looks like between the buyback 
and the sort of narrowing of the forecast, but not it not getting substantially worse, I guess, um, that the stock has, is rising at first blush here. Yeah, I mean, expectations were, were you know, fairly muted, Julie, heading into that. It was only up about 4% this year. I, I know it's, it's interesting. I mean, folks do look at FedEx as a kind of barometer for the overall economy, you know, specifically that the shipping volumes number. There were kind of interesting questions about weather and winter weather, how might, that might impact results, because remember there, there were those uh, service disruptions in January. Um, so there were questions about the impact that would have on, on revenue and costs. So it'll be interesting on the call to see what execs have to say about that. Other topics, I know updates on the company's cost cutting program, that's in focus mm -hmm. for investors in this name. And also it's contract with the United States Postal Service, that is due to expire in September. So they'll get questions about that as well. Yeah, the company also saying, by the way, that cost per package was flat here and that operating results did improve due to lower structural costs, which is interesting. Uh, Raj Subramanian, the, Subramanian, the uh, president and CEO, saying in this statement, pointing out, highlighting two consecutive quarters of operating income growth and margin expansion, even with lower at revenue. He points to that as what he calls clear evidence of the progress we're making on our transformation as we navigate an uncertain demand environment, i.e. the cost cutting that you were referring yep. to. Yep. Moving on, Reddit stock soaring after making its highly anticipated market debut after originally being priced at around 34. Shares now reaching highs of about 50 here. It is the first social media company to go public in five years. We were on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange this morning and caught up with the CEO who told us he expects the 19-year-old company to finally start turning a profit. In the second half of the last year, we were profitable on an adjusted EBITDA basis. Uh, we grew costs uh, uh, slower than revenue last year, revenue three times as fast. And so I like the way, the trend that we're on. Um, and I think if we can keep doing that, we're in great shape. What gets you to sustainable profits? Look, the work that we're doing right now. I think our work is working. Um, Reddit, we have such high margins that if we just continue to sell and we continue to be mindful about costs, this company scales, I think, in a really impressive way. Let's bring in now Tom Sosnoff, the founder and CEO of Tasty Live and an investor in Reddit since last year. Tom, it is good to have you on the show. So you are, Tom, a Reddit investor. I'm just curious, Tom, to start with why you invested. What did you see about Reddit that you liked? What I saw on Reddit at the time was, well, first, I use, I use the platform, so I like it, obviously, know about it. But I think at the time, I thought about it, you know, and you got to remember, last summer, Prices to me seemed expensive in the stock market, even though they're a fraction of what they are today. But at the time, they seemed expensive. And I thought Reddit after, I remember you know, reading about it at the $15 billion offering and also at the $10 billion offering. And at the time, I thought, OK, well, if they've discounted it by you know, 60, 67 percent off the top offer or you know, half of the 50 um, percent off the second one, I figure, you know what? It's a cheap shot here, relative. And I also love social media apps. So I love social media. So I thought, okay, it's a reasonable investment. I, I, you don't know though. You never know, I guess. There's no sure yeah. things in, in, uh, in investing yeah. or in life, Tom. Um, but you know, I imagine that you're relatively pleased to see this action on the first sure. day. I mean, you know, how long, how long do you ride it then? Like, how do you think about this as an investment, short term, long term, medium term? Well, the funny thing is that, you know, I mean, I'm sure you guys know, anytime you buy um, uh, you buy a company that's not a public company, and there's no guarantee that they're going to go public. You're, you're, you know, you don't necessarily have a way out. There's no exit strategy for that. So one of the risks of buying a company that's not publicly traded is they might never go public, and you might never be able to get out. Um, in the case of Reddit, um, I am personally I'm locked up for six months. So, but I don't know if I will sell it. You know, even six months from now, I might hold this for, you know, for years to come. I, I really don't know. Um, I I appreciate what they do because I know how hard it is to get millions of users to use a platform. And I also appreciate kind of the intellectual side to Reddit. I think it's very interesting for a social media app. So, um, you know, I, I guess we'll have to make a judgment. We'll have to see if that management team can actually, if going public makes them into a different kind of company where they become something special. I, none of us know. Tom, do you also see this as kind of a, a smart AI play? I mean, that's in part what Reddit's kind of pitching here. You know, we'll be uh, sort of selling data um, to Google for their models, train their models. Although it sounds yeah, like, I, you know, sounds like regulators might have some questions there. But what do you think, Tom? 
Well, first of all, I, I don't love I, I love Reddit. I don't love Reddit technology. Um, I think there there's too many purists on Reddit that 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 love the way it is, almost like baseball purists. And and I wish their technology was a little better. I don't know. I don't like when companies say, well, you know, we can sell our data and we can do that. I don't think that really is, that's not what excites me about Reddit. What excites me about Reddit is I think the companies that have a few hundred million relatively active users learn how to monetize those users when they become public because they're forced to. And sometimes forcing companies to learn how to monetize users is a is, is something that you know you can't underestimate what going public does in that situation. So you know, as somebody that's run multiple public companies, you know, I've been down that road before, and it it's I, I think you're going to see Reddit be a very different company a year or two from now. Um, Tom, what do you um, think about the whole you know Wall Street bets phenomenon? I mean, obviously you're very. You're very keyed yeah. in with the retail trader, right? So you have both the Wall Street bets phenomenon as a potential risk or a potential benefit, I guess, for Reddit. You have the fact that they've offered shares to some of their users. How is that all going to play out? Well, I love the fact that they offered shares to their moderators and their Redditors, you know, and because I think that having skin in the game, it's a hell of a commitment to what Reddit asks to self-police a social media app and to ask and for reddit to ask their you know their redditors to do what they do it's it's incredibly time consuming it's resource draining and i think that you know their community is crazy healthy and and that's really it's it's um i like to compare the, they have a very sticky community and and i think that's something that's really valuable so i like the fact that now people have skin in the game. I think yesterday we were making a comparison to Reddit is the closest thing to a digital asset for a social media company. And what that means is just like people when they buy Bitcoin or they buy ETH, they almost never want to sell it. It's like a passive long. I kind of feel like Reddit's going to have a little bit of that going for it as a social media app where people that use the product, they're not going to want to you know, necessarily trade it as much as they're going to want to hold it. Well, we'll see how that ends up playing out for them and for you, for that matter, Tom. It's great to see you. Hope to catch up again soon. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much. Thanks. Let's take a look at shares of Nike now. That company reporting its fiscal third quarter results. The shares up by about 4.5%. And that's as uh, Nike reports revenue of $12.4 billion. That's versus the $12.31 billion that analysts had been anticipating. Earnings per share at $0.77. Cents. It looks like that that is uh, above what analysts had been anticipating as well. Um, gross margin a little bit shy here at 44.8%. 45.1% is what analysts have been anticipating there. And finally, greater China revenue, which always gets a lot of attention, $2.08 billion, roughly in line to slightly better than what analysts had been anticipated. Uh, anticipating John Donahoe, the CEO of Nike, uh, talking about making the necessary adjustments to drive Nike's next chapter of growth. Nike's been sort of trying to right-size its strategy with where it sells its merchandise, right? What channels does it use? It has really bulked up its direct-to-consumer over the past few years, but it still seems to be figuring out, Josh, you know, it's sort of like Dick's Sporting Goods, Foot Locker, mm -hmm. Department Store, the, what the right balance is. Yeah, it, it's been tough going for Nike. I mean, heading into this report, this stock was really beaten down. I mean, it was down about, it was about down 10% this year, it was down about 20% over the past 12 months. Um, some questions about, um, I know analysts have raised about leadership and new product on, on the way, as well as competition in China for sure. Yeah, most definitely. So all of this uh, playing out as we see the shares, even as we talk, sort of cut that uh, first blush increase reaction that we saw. Coming up, uh, we're going to talk more about Nike on the back of that latest earnings report. We'll get analyst reaction to the numbers on the other side. Stick around, more market domination over time. Coming up.
Lululemon and Nike out with their latest quarterly results. Let's dig into the retailer's performance with Morningstar equity analyst David Swartz. David, it's always good to see you. Why don't we start with uh, Nike here, David? It's up about 2% in the after hours. Give us your take on that report. It looks like the uh, EPS was a little bit higher than I expected. I was at 63 cents for the quarter. Um, so it looks like on an adjusted basis, it was uh, closer to a dollar, just under a dollar. So um, that's not uncommon for Nike. Nike has been consistently beating EPS estimates. On the top line, uh, sales are very close to what I had. It was just below 12.4 billion and Nike reported just slightly above 12.4 billion. Um, so the sales were in line. Obviously this was not an extremely strong quarter. Um, having flat sales for Nike is not a great result, but um, that was anticipated because the company had told us in the last earnings call back in December that the sportswear market was weak and several other companies have since corroborated that. Uh, the sportswear, sportswear market might be weak, but Nike had sort of, for a while there, had sort of been its own machine, right? Um, and so what does it need to do to sort of get back to that place? Yeah, there's been a lot of talk in recent months about how Nike has really lost its way in some ways. Uh, the company perhaps has fallen behind some others in terms of um, innovation and new products. Um, so there has been con some concern about that. Uh, clearly there are economic challenges in all of its major uh, regions, including China, for example. Um, you, I'm sure as you're aware, uh, youth unemployment in China is quite high and that's Nike's core demographic. And the China market is extremely important for Nike, both for sales growth as well as earnings growth because it is a very profitable market. In the U.S., uh, Nike still does have exposure to wholesale accounts, uh, despite its growth in DTC over the years. And wholesale right now has been weak. We've seen negative sales reports from department stores in the last few weeks. Uh, and that does affect Nike. And then in Europe, uh, it's been kind of mixed, too. So um, Nike is still the best performer in the industry, but uh, it, it is impacted by industry trends just like everybody else. Uh, and David, let's also switch gears, talk about Lululemon, which is going in the opposite direction. It's down about 9% here in the after hours. What's your take on, on their results? Yeah, as, as you mentioned earlier, it looks like it's probably the outlook that was a bit of a concern. Um, I was at 14% sales growth for 2024, and the press release says 10 to 11%. Now, you have to remember, though, that Lululemon does have a history of um, promising low and delivering high. Uh, so, I, you know, I'm always a bit skeptical about their guidance. Uh, but that is a bit of a disappointment because although 10 to 11 percent would be extremely strong for anybody else in, in the uh, activewear industry, uh, Lululemon has always outperformed so, so many others uh, for such a long period that expectations are just really high. And as for the stock movement, uh, the stock is quite expensive and has been really for a long time. I've been one of the few analysts that has thought that it's been quite overvalued. And that's kind of what happens when you have an overvalued stock. Uh, if there is even a mild disappointment, the stock can fall pretty fast. Yeah, and indeed, the stock has already been falling a little bit year to date. It's down about 6% here. So what are you going to be looking to sort of find out on the call to get a better sense of, of, of whether this is Lululemon just sort of, as you say, typically guiding low or if it actually is seeing growth slowing? Yeah, uh, I'm sure there'll be questions about the situation in China, which is where Lululemon is opening a lot of stores. And uh, the, the economy there is not so strong at the moment. Um, and then also in North America, which is still its biggest market, you know, what, what's the outlook for new stores, um, some new products like the expansion into men's, for example, and footwear. Uh, like, um, Lululemon um, has been rolling out footwear and they're going to roll out uh, shoes for men, I think, soon. Um, so they're going to be even more um, in competition with Nike and other sportswear companies. And, and right now, footwear is not a big enough market for Lululemon to really matter. But it is interesting to see how they say it's going to look in the future. David, always good to see you. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Time now for what to watch Friday, March 22nd, starting off with the Fed. 
Federal Reserve Board will host a Fed Listens event tomorrow with Fed Chair Jerome Powell set to deliver opening remarks. It's coming just days after the central bank kept rates unchanged at its March meeting. Powell saying during his press conference that a strong jobs market would not deter the Fed from cutting rates. And sticking with the Fed, we'll get another round of Fed commentary tomorrow from Vice Chair for Supervision Michael Barr and Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic. Both will be speaking in the afternoon and Wall Street will look for more clues from Fed officials after the new dot plot indicated most members see three rate cuts ahead this year. And finally, after today's debut, Reddit gets ready for its first full day of trading on the New York Stock Exchange. Tomorrow, shares of the social media company jumping more than 40% in today's trade after pricing its IPO at $34 per share. And that'll do it for today's Market Domination Overtime. Be sure to come back tomorrow for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned, though. We've got more Yahoo Finance on the other side. City reiterating a buy rating on Zillow with a price target of $68. This coming against the backdrop of that $418 million settlement from the National Association of Realtors. Our next guest, though, says the impact of that will be minimal. For more, we're bringing in City Senior Internet Sector Analyst Ron Josie. Ron, thank you so much for being here. 
We have spent the past few days trying to wrap our heads around this thing. I'm going to be sure. honest with you, Ron, <laughs> because it's sort of a complicated issue. And we have seen the negative sentiment flow through to Zillow and some of its competitors. So lay it out for us. Why is this not going to be a problem for Zillow? Yeah, so um, there's a few things. One is the settlement just came out, right? So we're still learning how it, how what it means and how the rip, what the ripple effects are throughout the industry. But our view here is that the settlement doesn't um, cancel or get rid of the commissions for buy side agents. And in fact, you can still move forward with that. A sell side agent can still do that, just maybe not within the MLS. And so our view here is that because commissions can continue and because the seller can potentially continue to do that, we don't envision a major disruption, at least immediately, to the overall business. Now, to be clear, still early, uh, you know, this thing goes, the, the new settlement goes into effect, I think, in midsummer of this year. And so we'll have to We'll have to see what happens. But frankly, from our perspective, we think that the buy side agent or agents to provide a lot of value to the to the consumer or the home buyer, whether they're on the buy side or the sell side, particularly if you're a first time buyer, it's still a very complicated process. And for that reason, we think commissions can continue. Regardless, though, it's something that we're monitoring, something we're watching. And our view on Zillow is sort of bigger picture. If we take a step back, if we don't think things are going to change that immediately, we, we believe their their new, call it, enhanced market strategy of going, going close to the transaction um, with sell-side listings being a big opportunity, rentals, et cetera. There's a lot going on at Zillow that they're in the middle of executing on, and, and we think that's going to surprise um, in terms of maybe inflection in numbers to the upside. So on that last point, Ron, just so I'm following, so, so part of your thesis is that just Zillow's business has changed, it's just more diverse now, Completely. tools, services, rentals, and in some way, your bet here is that kind of insulates them from potential impact. Yeah, our, our bet here is we don't think things change that dramatically, that immediately. Uh, it's possible you do get to some sort of a la carte, but when we take a step back and we think about Zillow's business, Look, over the past several years, I'd say five plus years, Zillow has been calling their premier agent base to focus only on those agents that actually return the leads that they're getting from Zillow. Um, on top of that, they've been investing in new productivity tools. They bought Showing Time. They just recently acquired a company called Follow Up Boss. Follow Up Boss, and so you have these newer tools that are helping agents become more effective. And then you add in the potential for seller listings and you add in the rentals business becoming bigger, mortgages being a part of it as Zillow becomes part of the transaction. This is the year, 2024, when we can actually get into execution of this new strategy as opposed to beta testing and testing all these new ideas over the past several years. And that's really what gets us excited about what's happening at Zillow today. Ron, I'm curious, even before this um, this settlement was finalized, there was a short seller who came out uh, with a call against Zillow. And in addition to the settlement, um, or, or the potential settlement, he also called out the idea of competition for Zillow. So I, I'm curious how you're thinking about that issue right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's well. There's a lot going on within Zillow. Not notwithstanding, by the way, mortgages being certainly higher than they were several years ago. I think home sales and transactions were at multi-decade lows last year, and, and Zillow's projection expects that to continue this year. But when we think about competition overall, look, in our view, Zillow is the and I think this is a positive, the Kleenex in the industry. In other words, when you search for a home on Google, most people search for Zillow versus home sales in the zip code from our understanding. And when we look at Zillow trends or even our view on where similar web or center tower, some third party providers that look at traffic, Zillow always ranks significantly higher than the competition. And, and on top of that, this is a brand that's been around for a while. And so when we think of the 200 plus million monthly unique visitors that come to Zillow, you know, month in, month out, we think it's going to be very hard to for a competitor to really come in and disrupt that. And, and Ron, another issue that's been raised here, you know, potential impact on just the the, the pool, the size of the pool of real estate uh, sure. agents out there. Any thoughts on that dynamic? Yeah. Um, look, if if buy side commissions do come down, as as some might suggest they they do. There will certainly be less agents. There's a lot more buy side agents today than there are sell side agents that represent a seller. Um, and also, I think the if you just look at those 
uh, agents who are members of the National Association of Realtors getting to like 1.5 million. A lot of them are part time. A lot of them don't do this as their full time job. And so maybe what happens if there is a major change in how commissions are structured or or paid out that some of those part time agents don't don't stay as part time. Um, and, and you do have some fallout there. But again, this is our view that if that were to happen, Zillow has been calling its data, its agent base for some time now to only focus on the, those agents that call back the leads, right? Um, and as a result, I'm not too sure there is uh, another platform or site out there with 200, what Zillow did, 194 million uh, monthly uniques in, in 4Q. I'm not too sure there's another site at that same size and scale that can really compete for for leads and listings, and so that that's what gets us makes us feel pretty positive on on shares at this at these levels. And and finally, Ron, given your positivity, given your price target at sixty eight dollars, uh, what do you think is going to be the next? I mean, obviously you see the positive yeah. story. What's going to be the catalyst to get other people to see the positive story? Yeah, look, I mean, obviously results is always the first answer to that. But but frankly, I think it's going to be um, them diversifying their business. So it's not just results on the revenue or premier agent. It's basically seeing traction across something called Listing Showcase, which is a new product sponsored uh, listing ad for listing seller listings. It's seeing greater overall traction within their rentals business, where I think they have a very strong um, database for single family homes and are adding more multifamily structures there. It's seeing greater ra uh, tie ratios or call it um, overall view of the uh, um, complete transaction from not only the buy or sell, but also adding a mortgage. And so there, there's all these things that we think we're going to start to see come together throughout this year and for the next several years. And so as this comes together, I think the business can be more profitable. And so frankly, it's uh, it's all of those things, that, uh, you know, maybe not all at once, but getting better throughout throughout the year and then throughout the next couple of years that makes us positive on the name. Ron, thank you so much for joining us today and laying out the case. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thanks, guys. Coming up, we're speaking to the CEO of My Bundle, a company that helps users package streaming and cable options to help get the best deal. Stick around, more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
You've heard of cutting the cord, but our next guest is helping consumers shave the cord. My Bundle is helping package streaming and cable options for viewers in a constantly changing streaming landscape. For more, we have My Bundle co-founder and CEO, Jason Cohen. Jason, it's good to have you. Uh, maybe to start, Jason, just for viewers who, who might not be familiar, just to walk us through a little bit more about My Bundle. What, what do consumers uh, turn to you for? Sure, no, Josh, first, thanks for having me. So we do a bunch of different things, which always makes this fun. Uh, the first thing we do is we help consumers, as you said, shave the cord, looking for an alternative to a cable or satellite TV package. We help them find the YouTube TVs, the Hulu Lives, the Slings, which one of them has the channels that, that they need, which makes it super easy to save a lot of money. So for consumers, we help them do that. We also go into finding the best package of streaming services for cord cutters or cord devers, helping you find shows and movies across your services, um, talk about watch lists and what comes next. So that's how we're helping um, consumers really navigate this new, very complicated streaming ecosystem. And then we partner, which I'm sure we'll get to, but we partner with the broadband industry and the streaming services themselves to really bring it all together and just make the ecosystem work better. Jason, do so do people get sort of a discount on any of the services when they're bundled together? I mean, that's something that the likes of Verizon are starting to offer here. Or is this more about tailoring it so people can get the stuff that they want to watch? Yeah, great question. So think about steps. Like step one is, what is the right service for me? And that's what we're doing today. If we fast forward all the way to the end goal, which we're doing with our broadband providers, is our broadband providers are giving not just discounts, but giving them away for free. Sign up for a gig, get $100 of streaming credits. Sign up or upgrade to a gig, and we'll give you this service for six months for free. So we're really working with the broadband industry to help make those offers a reality. You mentioned Verizon with their Plus Play. Think of it as Plus Play for the rest of the broadband industry. And there are about 3,000 internet providers out there. It's kind of crazy. And so we're that platform sitting between those broadband providers and the streaming services out there. And, and you know, Jason, there's so many streaming services at this point, it's hard to keep track. I mean, do consumers, do they want all these options? Is the demand there? Yeah, so we think, what, you know, very from our, from our studies and from other studies and from obviously talking to consumers, it's not that they want less, it just needs to be simple. I say you don't need consolidation in the streaming industry, but you do need aggregation. So if it's easy for consumers to bundle, if Julie, like you mentioned, if when you the more you bundle, the more you save, which is where we think this is all heading, um, ultimately consumers don't want less, they just need somebody to help them figure it all out and manage it all. Um, how do you guys make money, Jason? Do you, do you charge a fee? Do you collect fees from these broadband companies? How does that work? Yes, yeah, so again, great, great question. So a couple of ways. So what we do is basically the broadband providers pay us a, what we like to think, very low uh, monthly SaaS fee. But what this is really also about is actually helping the media companies, the streaming services, navigate this world as well. As you listen to their earnings calls, they're all talking about bundling and finding new customers and retaining those customers. And how do they do it? Well, what my bundle is doing is aggregating the broadband industry for each streaming service. So they only have to come to my bundle for one integration and get access to, we have now over 220 broadband providers with 13 million internet customers that are my bundle partners. And so the second part is getting paid by the streaming services the same way they pay those little companies like Google or Apple or Amazon. Um, the difference is we're not big tech, we're not trying to eat their lunch. We're little tech and we're saying we're here to help. And so we earn that revenue from the streaming service and then share that with the broadband provider. And so we're really, everything my bundle does, it's all about creating those win-win-wins for our consumers, our broadband partners, and the streaming services to make this whole streaming ecosystem a lot simpler. And you know, Jason, there's a new sports uh, streaming service coming, uh, Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers teaming up. Just interested to get your thoughts on, on there. What do, you, what do you think the reception's gonna be like? Is the demand there for that? 
Yes, we know one of the things with our tools, right? We know what channels people pick and what they're interested in. And there definitely are consumers that are more into sports versus not. Um, just quickly, like before starting my bundle, I was actually in the finance world. I watched you guys back in my in my old my old job at a hedge fund, um, investing in media and telecom. And the reason we started my bundle was specifically because the the thought was this is all going to fragment with the internet. The internet's going to come. We're going to go from a closed system to an open ecosystem. The middle is going to be messy. We're right now right square in the middle, where there's going to be more services and more choice and more options. And what we're all about is matching up the people that want those channels and don't need the other channels and the idea of helping people find that. And so we do think there is demand. There's a lot more demand for streaming. We think there's going to be a lot more shifting over from traditional facilities-based TV over to streaming. And specifically, whether it's this and then ESPN direct-to-consumer, which will come the next, which is a skinnier, skinny version of that, we think there's going to be more and more options, and that's not a bad thing. But it's not a bad thing as long as a company like My Bundle or some of the other companies like the large, large cable providers or, like you said, Verizon, somebody needs to be there to help the consumer put, put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Um, and we think Humpty Dumpty, not to kill that metaphor, but um, it's going to look a lot better. And the end result of this is way, way better for consumers than how it used to be when they have that little bit of help. Jason, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Coming up, after decreasing for a couple of weeks, mortgage rates are once again on the upswing. We'll dive into the latest housing hurdles on the other side.
Mortgage rates ticked up after several weeks of declines, as according to Freddie Mac, but home builders remain confident in the housing market, buoyed by expectations of rate cuts in the year ahead. Joining us now for more is Danny Ramiro. Danny. It's all about the Fed. The Fed's projections to cut interest rates uh, three times this year is really suggesting that mortgage rates are going to soften even more so this year and really giving the housing market that boost that it needs. Look, the central bank doesn't set mortgage rates, but its policy moves really consequently impact borrowing costs. Mm -hmm. And yeah, mortgage rates have been hovering around that 7% this year, but economists are really hopeful, especially at Wells Fargo. They're expecting mortgage rates to hit around 6.6% in the second quarter of this year. That's a lot lower than the 6.8% we're seeing this week. Um, bottom line, the backdrop looks really good for home builders. Housing starts for both multifamily and single family bounce back in February, really signaling the market right there that we're seeing this uh, recovery happening. The more housing market's healing in some some way. And also home builder confidence remains resilient. And one last thing, I think I thought this was really interesting, is that home buying activity really is staying stuck on the upper end. There's not a lot of entry level homes right now that's really scarce. So that's another reason for home builders to still keep building. Interesting. What are risks there that, that people point out to you as you go through the research notes for the sector? The, the risk right now is if the resale market unlocks itself, that could heat up some competition, right, for some home for home builders. But really, I mean, analysts have been asking that on the calls, on different calls, and it seems like home builders are kind of like, hmm, okay, if it does unlock itself, I, we're not too concerned because they can still offer those incentives that are really attractive, especially for first-time home buyers. And that's really where the sourness and the weakness of the housing market is really happening is on that affordability front. Right. Thanks, Danny. Well, sticking with the housing market, home buyers are now facing uncharted territory in the wake of the realtor settlement that dismantles the way commissions are paid. On one hand, buyers could face more hurdles as the system changes and home prices stay elevated. But on the other hand, they could gain price transparency and negotiating power. Our Rebecca Chen has compiled a list of top tips to help navigate the new rules. Rebecca, it's, uh, it's tricky. It is tricky. And I think with the new host settlement that is coming out, we are seeing that home buyers are maybe getting a little bit short end of the stick because they might be stuck with paying for their own agents. But on the opposite end, like you mentioned, they could be getting a lot more negotiation power and as well as transparency. And we talked to a couple experts and they are giving us tips on how home buyers can navigate this new territory. And tip number one, it was really just, you have to look for a suitable agent. Now, I know you guys might be thinking, you know, regardless of where we are, whether we have the settlement or not, you should always be looking for a suitable agent. But what is really different this time is because you're paying out of pocket, you really want to make sure you find that person that is good for you. So look at your needs. What do you need in an agent? Research and interview them to make sure that they are what you want. Uh, for example, if you are a first time home buyer, you really want to find somebody that can walk you through the entire process. Uh, somebody who can hold your hand and tell you what to do at each step. But if you're somebody who has already bought and sold multiple houses, then maybe you can do a little bit of a reduced service kind of negotiation. And that brings me to my tip number two, uh, which is if you know what you want, you can find a reduced age, reduced service agent or even opt out for something like a a la carte service. What this means is you sort of do a lot of your own homework. You schedule your own appointment, you drive yourself to these showings, and you talk, you research the neighbors yourself. But when it comes to the harder part, like the transaction, then you lean on a higher professional to carry you through. Uh, and you can also do this like a menu style a la carte. You could go to your agent and say, uh, I, kind, I can do everything I, myself, but I need you to help me draft a contract or uh, help me negotiate or evaluate my uh, potential home and then I'll pay you for those services only. So I think what is going on is this this settlement is really uh, giving more giving more option to home buyer. And then the last one and the most important one is to negotiate the prices. Now that everything is up for negotiation and there is this sort of um, you can you can talk about how much you want to pay, make sure you take advantage of that and look for value in your service. Rebecca, thanks so much. Appreciate it.
That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Good night.